Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Donna Lucas, and I'm the CEO and president of Lucas Public Affairs. But more importantly, I serve on the PPIC's board of directors and have been on the board for four years. It's quite an honor. I'd like to welcome you to the Bechtel Conference Center for this important conversation about California's fiscal policy. Uh, this is exactly the type of event we envisioned when the PPIC designed the center uh, with the support of the Bechtel Family Foundation. The center has been open since March, and already PPIC is broadening the conversation about critical policy issues in California. Uh, that, I'm getting to that later. Turn your phones off. From, <laughs> from economic policy to water policy to health care. This event today is part of uh, PPIC's 2011 speaker series on California's future. Um, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this series very, very much. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this type of thing without our sponsors, including the Stewart Foundation, the James Irvine Foundation, uh, Pacific Life Foundation, San Diego Gas and Electric, and McKinsey and Company. The series is also funded by contributions of unrestricted support of PPIC's donor circle. Uh, before we get started, two brief requests. First of all, you'll see on your chair there is an evaluation form. We ask that you fill those out before you leave after the event. So you can give it, this is, you can rate the treasurer. So that will be good, right? <laughs> and um, could you also please silence your phones, uh, Blackberries, et cetera, so we don't have any, any interruptions. Um, we're going to first hear from Maggie Weston, a PPIC policy associate based here at PPIC, Sac or she's based in Sacramento, the PPIC in Sacramento. There we go. And she'll give a brief overview of the current budget situation in California. Um, after Maggie's uh, remarks, Treasurer Lockyer will join PPIC President um, Mark Baldessari, who's right here, uh, to talk about the fiscal challenges facing California. And uh, before I turn the program over to Maggie, I'd just like to say what it is an honor to have someone like Treasurer Locke here, here um, as a board member. It really is for him to take the time to be here. I've worked in California politics uh, almost 30 years. I know I started when I was 13. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you find you, through the years you get to know the players and the actors, and there's a lot of people uh, up at, who come through that town, but Bill Lockyer is someone who has been a true public servant. He's probably, I always say he's one of the smartest, if not the smartest, uh, people who are working up there. So it really is a pleasure and an honor to have you here today. So with that, Maggie. Thank you, Donna, for the introduction. Um, and before we get started with uh, Treasurer Lockyer, I just want to take a few minutes to briefly um, explain California's budget process, the 2011-12 budget, and some of the um, potential challenges over the next few months. So by law, the governor must release a budget proposal each January for the fiscal year that begins July 1 of that calendar year. In May, the governor releases a revised proposal that includes revised revenue estimates um, and any changes to the January proposal. The legislature then has until June 15th to pass a budget bill. And in November 2010, Californians approved Proposition 25 which lowered the legislative votes necessary to pass a budget bill from a two-thirds majority to a simple majority. Tax increases, however, still require a two-thirds majority vote of each house of the legislature. In January, Governor Brown estimated a $25.4 billion budget gap covering the remainder of 2010-11 and all of 2011-12. He proposed addressing that budget gap through a mix of spending cuts and revenues with revenues primarily coming from a voter-approved extension of the 2009 temporary increases to the vehicle license fee, the personal income tax, um, and the sales and use tax. After months of negotiation, the tax extensions failed to garner enough Republican votes to reach the two-thirds threshold to either extend the taxes or place them on the ballot. The final budget passed uh, June 28th with no Republican support spends $85.9 billion from the state's general fund, a 6% decrease from last year. Despite the expiration of the temporary tax increases, the budget gap was still solved through a mix of spending cuts and revenues. The $11.1 billion in spending cuts include large reductions to health and human services programs and higher education, including $2 billion to the state's Medi-Cal program, um, which is the Medicaid program, 
and $1.4 billion to the University of California and the California State University systems. On the revenue side, the legislature did not extend the tax increases. So instead, these revenues primarily stem from $11.8 billion in higher than expected tax receipts last year and higher projected revenues for this year. Additionally, the budget includes revenues from a new fire fee on rural homeowners and sales tax on internet purchases from out-of-state retailers. Finally, $1.7 billion in property tax revenues from redevelopment agencies will offset state spending on K-14 education. Should the projected revenues fail to materialize this year, the state will impose additional cuts depending on the size of the shortfall. If revenues are off by more than $1 billion, the majority of additional cuts will affect health and human services programs and higher education. If revenues fall short by more than $2 billion, the state will further reduce the school year by seven days and increase community college fees. Although the budget has only been in place a few months, uh, legal and other potential challenges to the plan have emerged. First, redevelopment agencies have filed a lawsuit to block their elimination and the property tax transfers. Second, Amazon.com is in the process of collecting signatures uh, to put the internet sales tax measure on the ballot for a referendum. Referendum papers have also been filed on the rural fire fee. Additionally, draft regulations released this week on the fire fee would bring in significantly less revenue than is anticipated in the budget. And finally, tax receipts in July were lower than expected, feeding fears um, that the mid-year budget cuts will be triggered. In addition to this year's budget challenges, California faces significant long-term fiscal challenges. In May, Governor Brown highlighted $35 billion owed to schools, community colleges, bondholders, special funds, and others in debt incurred to close past year's budget gaps, including payment deferrals. This, uh, in addition, the state has an estimated $181 billion in unfunded pension and retiree health benef uh, liabilities. And over the last 20 years, the portion of state funds dedicated to debt service has tripled to approximately 6%. Governor Brown had proposed using a portion of the extended uh, tax increases to start paying down some of this debt. Since those increases did not pass, um, he now intends to put tax increases on the 2012 uh, ballot aimed at reducing the state's chronic budget gaps and the state's outstanding debt. So having tried now to set a little bit of context for today's event, I would like to now turn it over to PBIC President and CEO Mark Baldessari and State Treasurer Bill Lockyer. Thank you. Well, I'm Mark Baldessari, President of PPIC and Treasurer Bill Lockyer. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I really want to thank um, Treasurer Lockyer for taking time off for, from a busy day, which you've... Um, this is not time off, it's work. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Well, being in a different setting yes. um, uh, this afternoon with us. And, and we, we've got a lot of, lot of questions we'd like to ask you. And I want to make sure that there's time for the audience to, to ask some questions as well. Um, by way of introduction, I, I don't think the treasurer needs any introduction, but I, I just want to briefly say this is a man who is who is just has amazing record of public service. 25 years in the legislature, in the assembly, and the state senate. Four of them served served as um, Senate Pro Tem. Um, eight years as Attorney General between 1998 and 2006, and now uh, in your second term as great state treasurer. So um, thank you very much for all that you've given throughout uh, the, the last um, several decades to California and Californians. Um, well, uh, Maggie promised not to, to, uh, to, 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 to give us too much of a, uh, uh, too many numbers or too depressing a scenario to begin with, but um, I think one, one place that we want to, uh, we, we want to start our conversation today um, really is with the budget. And um, what do you think the prospects are that we will have to do some sort of mid-year budget action, uh, given where our economy is today? Uh, thanks, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I love what uh, PPIC does uh, in the world. Um, 
you know, the budget, it's always good to keep it in this context. It's a statement of values of leaders in the state of what are the priorities and where should we be spending money on what kinds of programs. And, um, the immediate question, of course, is, well, are there going to be another round of cuts? Because there were, as Maggie mentioned, very substantial cuts in uh, education funding and health care and social safety net and so on. Um, and the answer is we don't know. Um, there is one bit of, I think, confusion. The uh, uh, sort of accounts of the shortfall were in the neighborhood of a half a billion dollars. You think, well, we're half a billion off. Uh, but that is comprised of two parts. About 40% of it is actually revenues that didn't come in equivalent to the forecast. The other majority of it is what they were hoping would come in in order to get to the four billion extra by the end of the year. So it isn't quite as, maybe, dismal as the uh, initial uh, numbers appeared, but it, it's still substantial and of course, um, it is still, June is our big revenue month, but the early spring, April, and so on is uh, Christmas season, are substantial revenue months, and so that makes it really impossible to predict uh, yet uh, whether there'll be a necessity of uh, further cuts or not. In that context, maybe it's worth mentioning as well that there already is substantial effort by uh, leaders of uh, affected groups to try to figure out how to undo the trigger before the legislature uh, adjourns in early September. And so there's a considerable anxiety about, well, if schools may get hit or uh, IHSS may get hit or whatever, is there some way we can untrigger the trigger? And I think there's uh, considerable determination by the governor and Department of Finance to not uh, make any retrograde motions uh, that uh, it was a prudent policy. It's uh, the first time in uh, over a decade that we've had a reasonably honest, balanced budget. And it's something we desperately needed to do. There were years of gimmicks and uh, imaginary revenues and uh, spending reductions that weren't real, and the list goes on and on. And, and uh, I think we suffered substantial reputational injury as well as some practical consequences because of those dishonest budgets. And Brown was determined to do an honest one. And I give him credit for doing that and being uh, resolute about it. Uh, there were a lot of pressures to do uh, fictions again uh, and just pretend uh, it would be OK and not make program spending cuts. And I'm, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it was a tough thing to do and a notable and a laudatory thing. So at, at what point do you uh, think that we will know more about Probably this? really not until December. December. Okay, so all the way till December. That's when the Department of Finance. I mean, you may get a trend. Yeah. And of course, we're all noticing the general okay. downturn in the economy and uh, consumer sentiment and other things that make everyone nervous about, about these numbers and the trend lines. Mm -hmm. uh, an added thing, and I, we frequently don't um, mentioned to people that we get 70, California gets seven, about this last year, $79 billion from federal expenditures. It's a lot of money. It uh, is 38% of the total aggregated uh, budget, uh, you know, and it's matches, in, you know, higher ed and healthcare and welfare and transportation and so on. Well, with the retrenchment in Washington, D.C., we may well see that number reduce significantly, which will, it doesn't bear on this, is there four billion extra or not? It's a different calculation than that, but it ripples through uh, programs in a substantial way that'll affect service levels. So uh, the governor had proposed that there be a, a measure on, on the ballot this year yeah. for the, the voters to um, extend the te temporary tax increases, provide some more revenues. Do you see that issue coming up again next year? Yes. And, and what, what type of revenue package do you imagine? Well. And when? Uh, you know, I, I have a sort of long history of making recommendations that are generally right and never listened to. Uh, <laughs> Well, let's hear it. So that's, 
But, uh, you know, I was one saying early in the year, you're going to do an all-cut budget, just get to it. The sooner you do it, the sooner you're going to have uh, balanced budgets and, and not deeper holes that you have to cut deeper to balance. And file the initiative today. Get it started now so that you could actually qualify for the ballot this year before the uh, substantial cuts occur. And um, there were different people and different interests that hated either idea. And uh, uh, from there were days when I think I got close to convincing policymakers that those were prudent things to do. And, and then I noticed within 12 hours they got talked out of it by someone that, or some group that I won't uh, identify, but you can probably uh, guess. Um, but anyhow, now we're still going to have this uh, continuing problem. And I guess what it relates to is the more fundamental issue is what's the size of, what should ga California government do? That's the debate. That's the fundamental argument. And, and one way to, I mean, you can look at the specific services, what's different. I did a chart that's kind of interesting, like what's different in 30 years? What's new? And not a lot, frankly. You know, small things, Ag, Labor Board, EPA, you know, there's some small, th IHSS, uh, Home Care Services are expanded. Um, but mostly it's new spending on health care. And so uh, a kind of difficult policy question is, was that the prudent thing to do? Uh, should we have hollowed out the higher education system in California uh, in order to pay for health care? Um, that's what we did. I don't think, I'm not sure that was the right choice, although I understand the difficulty uh, of it and, and that health care for people in a healthy workforce and healthy kids contribute to a strong economy, so they are related. But that's the practical uh, trend that we see. So um, a sort of related question is one that we hear sloganized in this way, where one side says, well, we have a revenue problem, and the other says, oh, no, you have a spending problem, not a revenue problem. Well, I like to look at the numbers. Uh, I used to say to colleagues when I was uh, a, a leader, in the legislature, um, you know, the plural of anecdote is not evidence. <laughs> Altogether, too frequently, anecdote and slogan drive the discussion and the policy debate. And, and uh, so here are the numbers. Just, you know, you know, I think if you hear them, it may help to decide, well, do we have a spending problem or a revenue problem? Okay. Um, Ronald Reagan, when it's different every year, so you have to kind of pick an average to make any sense of these numbers. But Ronald Reagan, as governor, was spending, general fund, $5.50 of every $100 of income. It, actually, it, AGI income. So $5.50 of uh, wealth uh, spent on uh, his general fund programs. Uh, George Dukmasian was spending six dollars and forty-five cents. Uh, Pete Wilson was spending six bucks. Uh, okay, Reagan five fifty. Jerry Brown's budget five dollars and ten cents. You would have to have a significant tax increase for Jerry Brown to be spending the same amount that Ronald Reagan was spending when he was governor. I think that addresses: is there a spending problem or a revenue problem? It seems to me we're you know federal revenues are at historic lows. State lev revenues are also so on. Um, there's a different debate about are you spending it well, are you spending it efficiently, that, okay, an important debate. But, um, so how do we convince people that there's a need to uh, tax themselves more? There's some things they, mostly they want lower taxes and more spending. Uh, kind of hard to do both of those at the same time. Uh, but, but that's what you see from poll data, and, and partly that's saying, well, we want what we do spend, what we want these programs, but we want you to do them more efficiently, and that's a, that's a fair thing to try to do. I've got my own list of sort of 20 things I touched over 20 years of, that I think made something more efficient in uh, government expenditures that I take some pride in, but th there's a lot of work like that needs to be done. There's been a 30 or 40 year constant effort to make government the enemy and government uh, 
spending bad, and, and uh, as a consequence, uh, it's hard to quickly get people to decide to invest more. Schools, clearly, uh, people want to spend more on schools, and, and I think that's probably the top of the list uh, for most voters. So um, I, I would just guess, I don't know yet, I know there's a lot of rumination about, well, what is the mixture of taxes? It's probably something like what the governor proposed this spring, and it didn't go anywhere, that is modest temporary increases that are broad-based in a number of different taxes. Uh, so you have some income, some sales, some fees, you kind of mix it up and it's not one big hit on one sector or, or group. Uh, that would be my uh, best guess about what it might be. And it has to qualify by initiative because it can't get through the legislature. So as, as somebody who, as treasurer, looks at the, the, the swings of volatility in our revenue system, are you amongst those who thinks that we need to have an overhaul of the tax system? Do we need, and do any of the um, different approaches to taxes other than what we have right now, do they seem particularly well, the favorable argument, to you? Yeah, they, with volatility, you know, the, there are those that really want to cut taxes, and particularly cut taxes on the wealthiest. Okay, I mean, that's their philosophy, I disagree, but that's what, what many want to do including the Parsky Commission and some of the people associated with that effort. So you don't agree with that? No. Okay. Um, uh, and um, I, I guess the point I would raise is two, and they're kind of on opposite sides of this. Mm -hmm. We have to be very, California relies on income taxes more than almost every other state. Most states, it's, cons it's sales taxes that are the largest tax. Sometimes it's uh, a larger, piece that's uh, real property taxes than what we do. But um, we, we rely a lot on income taxes and they're very progressive. Um, so the high end pays a lot. Now, uh, if you ask the question about people's ability to pay and then look at who's done well or who hasn't in the last uh, 20, 30 years, what you basically find is, and I, I, I'll get as close as I can recall to the correct number, but please uh, uh, look it up if you, or check back with me to get the precise number. The top 1% of income earners in California in the last 13 years took home, last year was a bad year, so when you average that in, it gets a little different number. Um, took home originally a dozen years ago, or 13 years ago, 12.5% uh, or 12.3% of all the income pool. Prior to this downturn, it was 25% of the income pool. They're doing fine and can afford, frankly, to pay more, um, as Warren Buffett and others have recently argued. The problem you have is they could decide to live in one of their other houses. And it's easy to make that decision and then even though your income is derived in California and we kind of chase you if your income comes from here, wherever you're hiding, uh, it, it's something you have to be careful about. And so for that reason only, just a practical one, I'd be very careful about uh, increasing burdens on, on the top and, and maybe even make modest reductions to make sure we don't lose uh, those revenue sources. Um, broadening the sales tax to services makes a lot of sense to me. The debate that Villaraigosa and lots of others have, uh, have tried to engage in whether we need to have a split role on property taxes is a fair debate. I, I'd be careful about that, frankly, for um, um, business uh, development reasons and economic development needs. But, but th th it's a fair argument. Uh, I, I think it's probably one that can't pass. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why you want to run up the hill if you can't get to the top of the mountain. But you know, mm -hmm. um, but those are okay. You know, the reasonable. The fundamental idea of the Parsky Commission was well, let's dramatically reduce corporate and income taxes, especially on the wealthy. Shift some to the middle income people, which already are quite burdened and enact a VAT-like uh, sales tax on transactions, which is probably unconstitutional mm -hmm. and results in a multi-billion dollar revenue shortfall. It doesn't balance out. So 
I think that the work was more ideological than uh, anything else. Right. Um, in Maggie's um, briefing earlier, she mentioned um, the debt level in California. The debt level is something that the treasurer is very interested in, obviously, and that you produce reports on and you're watching. And I, and I, I went back and read your to it. <laughs> I, I read your, uh, reread your report last night and um, talked about the denominator effect and our debt level, you know, proportion debt going up. Is that something you're worried about? Uh, yes. Uh, we should be sensitive to debt levels. And, you, you know, if, if, you know, it's a percentage of the GDP or a percentage of the general fund, so if the general fund shrinks, then it becomes a bigger percent, obviously, and, and it may not be a realistic measure uh, uh, over several years when you, when you have a downturn like this one. Uh, but uh, it's something we do have to be careful about. Now, to keep it in some context, uh, where you're talking about in uh, the largest economies on the planet in G10, uh, debt levels uh, compared to GDP are well in excess of 100%. You know, 212 in Japan and European countries over 100, and the United States probably approaching 90, and on and on. You start talking about us as a percentage of GDP, two or three percent. So it's really pretty modest compared to other sovereign entities. But you have to be careful about the trend, um, and uh, it's certainly politically uh, a hot uh, topic uh, mm -hmm. right now. Um, Maggie also mentioned the pension obligations, yes. and I think the number that I heard was 180 billion. Um, and you were very critical of the Little Hoover Commission report earlier in the year on pensions. You and I talked earlier about the recent report that came out talking about a hybrid pension systems. Uh, are, are, are pension obligations something that um, you're concerned about? Um, what do you think the solutions are? Well, here's what worries me because. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there's been a change in the uh, way in which we analyze uh, public policy options. And it used to be people would say, well, okay, let's figure out the facts. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. And increasingly what I have found is it's the reverse. It's I'll see it when I believe it. So you start with this philosophy and then find information that fits and reinforces your perspective. And that's kind of what's going on here. A lot of it is people that want to privatize pension systems, that think the private sector model is the right way to do it and why don't they do that in the public or they don't like public employee unions or their political influence or it's part of the cultural gestalt or whatever. Um, now. Uh, one of the consequences, and we saw it in the Little Hoover Commission too, one is they're saying, well, let's file lawsuits to cut existing pension obligations that have been made, that is, contracts that have been entered into. Now, I always thought for 600 years, conservatives thought the right to contract was a fundamental, inviolable right. <laughs> and suddenly, because we don't like the public employee guys, it's okay to say, well, we made a deal with you, but we've changed our minds. Mm. I don't think they legally can. Mm. And whether they can or not, it's going to be resolved by lawsuits that are already in the system. We don't need to file new lawsuits. God knows I ran the largest law firm in the state and worried about how many there are, why it is when you've got four lawyers in the room, you have at least seven opinions about what the law is. <laughs> so yeah, there'll be an argument about it. But the, it's already there in Colorado and a couple of other states. Let those work through the system to see what your options are rather than just a burden uh, with unnecessary litigation. And the second thing is they miscount mm -hmm. what the obligation is. Here's the theory. Because in the corporate world, the business may shut down. Mm -hmm. They have to figure out their pension liabilities as if the business terminated. And what would you do in that case? What do you, how do you figure out to build into your balance sheet covering those potential obligations, even though the system allows many of them to just dump them on the fund that uh, takes care of that, including public sector obligations? But So it's different. CalPERS or CalSTRS are never, ever going to go bankrupt. They're here. It, there's no termination date. 
And so when you calculate termination, what they say is, well, we're going to assume that if you have to shut down your fund, the only way you're going to pay the debt is to issue a bond. Mm -hmm. And you issue a bond, you get 3.5%, 4% return on your bond. That's the deal. Mm -hmm. Well, they're making 8.9%. Mm -hmm. Why should we assume that future investments are half what they've historically been? It gives you a ballooned number of debt obligations that's a phony one. And I think it's there because there's a political and ideological purpose behind the complaint. Now, there are unfunded obligations, and here's the problem. And I don't want to give up. There's a, some technical things you can do. Don't allow spiking, don't allow manipulation. You know, mostly these are people at the top of the pyramid in the public employee sector, whatever it is, who are taking advantage of the system and doing really well at figuring out how to put their vacation pay in or whatever else in order to balloon their retirement. Stop that stuff. Step on those guys. And they're starting to do it. The state actually in CalPERS has done it. The abuses mostly now are in county systems mm. uh, that have their own independent uh, system that aren't part of PERS. The state's pretty much done that. Uh, STRS needs to still do some more of it. In the, in the, it's not the teacher pay, but it's the administrator pay in the, teach, in the education world need to be some work. Well, those are kind of technical. And then over a lot of years, when you make small changes in the contributions employees make or employers make, or your assumptions about payouts or your benefit payouts and so on, when you do those things smartly and in a modest, graduated way, you can get to a funded system without horrible uh, dislocations. The problem is health care. And the problem is there's a huge unfunded health care liability that we haven't figured out nationally, private sector or public sector, how to cover. Mm -hmm. And everyone's plan, and it doesn't matter whose plan it is, they have different flavors, different rhetorical things they say. They're all rationing. They're all rationing health care. That's how they address the issues. Now, I love, and partly this is maybe the right place to talk about this, it is. Peter Schwartz is a, a think tank guy in the mm -hmm. East Bay. Yeah. Peter uh, was the international forecaster for Shell for a dozen years or so and uh, runs a think tank thing. And I, I phone him up periodically and say, what are you thinking about? So I did this recently <laughs> and Peter says, well, you know, I've been spending a lot of time around the health sciences guys. There's a wonderful, they're all, a lot of them are in California and they're doing really interesting things and you'll notice, you know, aging genome work with mice or whatever. He says, I, here's, here's what I predict. Uh, anyone that will stay alive for three more years, whatever age you're at, should plan to be around till 120 and play vigorous tennis or whatever at 119. Hmm. And anyone under age 40, which some of you are, hey, no ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Take the aging drug, about 40s, and you <laughs> stay there as many years as you want. Say, Peter, this is really hard on marriages <laughs> and pension systems. <laughs> but anyhow, I don't know what that means, but I, I do think we're in for a really, really Interesting. radically changed life expectancy that's going to have an impact on these things. Wow. Now, if you can stay healthy during those years and not spend huge amounts on uh, the last year of people's lives and the things we do currently, well, okay, um, maybe they'd be a little more willing to not fight as hard at the end if you live to be 130. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, so that's what's unfunded. Mm -hmm. On the pension side, 70% of it is from growth on investments that covers the debt. Mm -hmm. Not true on the health care. We're paying it for it, pay as you go, and that's a problem. Okay. Uh, one more question, then I'm going to turn it to the audience. Uh, I've been dying to ask you since uh, a few weeks ago. Well, don't die. We just talked yeah, about it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Three more years, right? Okay. Um, since since uh, the, the S&P downgrade and, and all the discussions about the federal um, debt and um, now the, the activities going forward, um, how do you view, because you've been pretty critical of credit rating uh, agencies in the past, how do, how do you view what took place in Washington how does it affect California? Well, here's the, uh, it's important, I think, to mention the criticism, because I think there's a, 
fundamental flaw in their analytics with the rating agencies. And, and it seems to me what people want, what an investor wants, if they rely on those A, A minus, et cetera, what's the likelihood of losing my money? Uh, that's what they're being told. What's the risk associated with these investments? And when the corporate scale likelihood of default is very substantially greater than the same grade on the public debt side, it doesn't make sense. They're, ri they're ranking public debt as riskier than corporate debt, and it's unfair. And it seems to me it, it misinforms uh, investors and the public. And so I'm pleased that Moody's, for example, has at least tried to make some effort to integrate their scales and have one rather than uh, two, et cetera. And it's mostly just how it historically grew up. And S&P, my belief is that they've been the great resistor. In my crueler moments, I call them poor standard rather than standard and poor. But, um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but it, they, they have a lot of really smart people that work hard at this stuff. And I think what... Um, I think where it's conceptually wrong is they want to provide what they call granularity. So it's something different than the risk of default. We know the federal government is not going to default on its debt. It's not going to do it. So if that's the test, it's AAA. And s and is wrong. Uh, but what they're saying is something different. They're saying Washington, D.C. is so dysfunctional the ideological problems are so great. The need to make uh, you know, all of these, whether revenue or spending cuts or those other decisions that are, that are imminent and necessary, they, and the system is so gridlocked that somehow or another we have to say there's more risk today than there was two years ago. And they're right about that. There is. And so I'm kind of sympathetic to S&P and think it was a courageous thing for them to do, even though I think the analytics are wrong. I, I, I get it. Yeah. And, you know, and I, so, and it did seem to have an impact on the culture in D.C. Now, as general policy goes, by the way, they're doing the wrong thing. Uh, it's a, this, is not an, this is a time that you need public spending, not retrenchment and austerity. And it's uh, the right way to budget, to spend, you know, save the money and bank the money, which, by the way, getting back to the volatility issue, mm -hmm. if there's volatility and big bumps in uh, temporary bumps, in capital gains or something else like that, bank it. Don't cut the whole tax rate, just bank the surpluses in the rainy day fund and use it in the, like now, mm -hmm. like rainy day. But um, so uh, I, I think the policy is the wrong one. Uh, both Democrats and Republicans, but mostly the R's, are so committed to spending cuts unthinkingly, I think, that are gonna add to the uh, problem in the economy. The fundamental problem in the economy is demand. 70% of our uh, GDP is consumer spending. It's off. It's going to stay off. And we're reducing it by adding risk, adding uncertainty, cutting income for people, refusing to you know, cut payroll taxes and other things that just add to the demand uh, uh, inadequacy is the wrong policy. Um, Business tax breaks don't do anything in this environment. High income tax breaks mostly get saved, not spent. Um, and uh, so public spending and, and some tax cuts like payroll taxes and others have a, 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 a greater impact. Um, so we're going to see federal retrenchment uh, and lots of cuts in uh, spending that's going to impact uh, higher education and other things in California. And part, maybe, maybe if you'll let me take a minute to say this. Long term strength of California, you know, there's this dialogue going on about Texas versus California, and it's just a sort of a way of people to try to understand what's going on in different parts of the com com country. And there, in the way the Democrats had the Massachusetts miracle 20 years ago with Dukakis, uh, the Texas have the Perry miracle, which is also fraudulent. Um, but, you know, it's an oil economy where they have in their state constitution that you can't do home equity borrowing like we did that contributed to the foreclosure crisis. They actually had a regulatory regime in Texas that was more severe than that in California, Nevada, and other states, and it helped them in this uh, kind of environment. Well, anyhow. Um, 
But the point is, they got a different kind of economy. They got poor people, they got people that didn't graduate from high school, they got sick people. Okay, great, have a nice time. Uh, we want a high income, high educated workforce and population in California. Those are the jobs of the future for us. And here's the best way I know to explain it. Half a century ago, three emerging cultures, Nigeria, Jamaica, Singapore, all have per cap income that's about the same, about 2,300 bucks per cap. Uh, they chart their future. Nigeria says, oh, it's resource development and oil. Um, Jamaica says it's tourism. The Singaporeans say, mm, we ain't got those, let's try higher ed. So what do you see some decades later? Nigeria and Jamaica haven't kept up with inflation. Their per cap income's about 5,300 bucks a year. Singapore, 24,000. Higher education works. It creates wealth, it creates jobs. And the worst thing we're doing in California is hollowing out our higher education system when we ought to be doing exactly the opposite. And so I would t make huge investment in that uh, area if I could. Well, Bill, thank you. I'm glad I got to ask those questions. And I, I, I know that a lot of other people have questions, so now it's their turn. Okay. Who's got a question for us? Oh, you're going to be easy on me. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm sure. Peter always has a question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask a very parochial question. To what extent? Oh, very parochial question. To what extent do the media contribute to the confusion uh, of the public and of the political system? A good question. Uh, I think uh, probably contribute to it in substantial ways. You know, I, I, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, you, there's very little in-depth reporting about budget issues and things of that sort, probably because there are no readers, but you know, so it's maybe responding to the audience on <laughs> that stuff that's pretty dreary. Uh, but um, you know, I, you see things like this, this uh, feeling that the, you know, there really is an obligation to somehow present both sides of an issue. So you get something like global warming, and you have 99% of the scientific community on one side of the debate, and it gets equal comment with the 1% that's on the other side of the debate, like there's some obligation to represent adequately the stupid people. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, but I, I see that happen in a variety of ways. And mostly when I read the stories about Sacramento stuff, there aren't a lot, first of all, but you know, mostly you get the little slogans from you know, well, you have a spending problem, uh, you know, well, we don't want to make those budget cuts, they would be awful, and that's kind of what you get. You, I've never heard, I have people say to me all the time, I've never heard these numbers about what Ronald Reagan was spending compared to Jerry Brown. I say, well, I say them all the time, but no one writes them down. <laughs> uh, Write them down. Yeah, but anyhow, so I guess there's some, you know, and I don't want to be overly <laughs> critical of the media, I think they try to do their job, and you know, it's getting thinner and thinner and harder and harder, and, there's so much media now that really is kind of niched ideological comment more than the old-fashioned journalism that we kind of grew up with that's, I, uh, that worries me. You had a question? Um, as you were talking about the state, much of it is about, and you alluded to this, about an ideological um, conflict. And what do you see breaking that? And what could be the roles of think tanks or the media or other institutions that influence voters? I want to hear the answer to this, too. Do you? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I want to hear the answer. <laughs> oh, uh, well, it's part of a national, there's a national divide. Mm -hmm. And there's a very substantial disagreement uh, between D's and R's and different people, different ages and regions and so on, over uh, the purpose of government and what, uh, what, how big the public sector should be, and, you know, things, as well as other issues that are abortion or whatever. We used to, uh, reserve sort of the um, uh, I'll fight to the death issues to mostly issues like slavery, abortion, you know, little, real tough social issues. Uh, now we're having those kind of debates about economics, about spending and tax policy. Uh, that's too bad because you used to be able to compromise in the economics world. You want to spend 100 bucks, I want to spend 50, well, how about 75? You know, and you used to be able to kind of just get by and work those things out, and we're not allowed to do that now. It's, it's much more uh, divisive. 
I think probably the only way it eventually works out is somebody wins. Uh, in California, uh, ultimately, I think, unless there's some very radical change of opinion, uh, with the, uh, emer the increasing engagement of new Asians and Latino population and voters, no es un problema, Democrats are going to run California for the foreseeable future. Uh, maybe there'll be a breakthrough Republican candidate once in a while. At the two-thirds level, you yeah. think? Yeah. I think that's ultimately, I don't know if that's next year, five years from now, but it's, you know. And the Republicans are, as, as people like Jim Brulte, the former Republican leader say, are irrelevant for California's future. Um, that distresses me. I really like bipartisan collaborative working. I think they each have something to add and say about uh, policy. But if they're unwilling to ever compromise in reasonable ways, then you don't have any choice but to run over them. And that's where it's gotten. It's too bad. But I, that's what happens nationally. Someone wins. Um, and I don't know what the answer, I don't know the answer to that nationally, frankly. I think that's still up in the air nationally. That is, who's the president and things of that sort. There are mechanisms like the Electoral College that provide a conservative outcome more so than might otherwise be true. And, and uh, things that uh, still show uh, that there's a closely divided national sentiment. Now, more of the conservative ideas are held by people who, well, unless Peter Schwartz is right and they're going to live a lot longer, uh, they're going to die before the more moderate liberal environmental, et cetera. The Klein to state voters, the uh, unaffiliated voters, are interesting uh, in the sense that while they tend to not like government and have that sort of general view of things. Uh, they're quite liberal with respect to things like minimum wage laws and uh, fairness. Fairness things are really important and environmental things are very important. So I think they ultimately wind up being largely on the D side of the ledger in terms of their fundamental uh, perspectives more than philosophy. Um, but uh, how that will be in other states in the country, I, I don't think we can say yet. Well, well, I, you know, I didn't say think tanks. Yes, they should play a role, an active role. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I've I heard you professor. previously be critical of the legislature as bill factory and um, admonishing legislators to stop introducing so many bills, and we haven't seen any reform on reduction of the limits. You mentioned that state spending hasn't necessarily increased significantly in 30 years. Do you see that the pace of regulation has decreased revenue? to the point where you would have expected the revenue to be greater? Or do you see any connection? Yeah, no, I think it's largely a fiction mm. that the regulatory regimes have impacted business expansion and uh, uh, revenue generation. Uh, largely a fiction. Now, that's not to say there aren't a lot of stupid ones and ones that somebody ought to get rid of. And, uh, you know, I do that just because it annoys uh, business in investors and others that have that stuff. Uh, and there's too much of it. So, but I, I, don't, I don't think anyone can really demonstrate in any convincing way that it's made a huge difference in mm -hmm. uh, job. In fact, there's Bank of America and other studies that suggest, for example, that strong environmental regulation and a strong and healthy business climate are, in fact, uh, partners, not uh, antithetical. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes? Who's going to come to town and help get some of these things done? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, you know, the easiest thing, it seems to me, I believe that Congress, you know, they really did insurance reform, not health care reform. Mm -hmm. um, that's fine, but uh, it would have been, I think, a lot, of sim a lot simpler, and now the opportunity is missed, but just do Medicare for everybody. Just everybody's in the Medicare system, and it's uh, relatively efficient, and uh, would have been, a, I think, a better, a stronger outcome. A single-payer system? Well, I just call it Medicare for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds better, huh? Yeah. Um, question back there. Mr. Locker, could you talk to us a little bit about high-speed rail bonds and the viability of the high-speed rail program generally? That was one of the audience questions. Oh, ah, okay. So, so got beat me to it. Thank you for mentioning that. Well, I was about to take it out of my yeah. pocket. 
one of the things we're going to have to do is to figure out how to intelligently prioritize and ration public debt issuance. Mm -hmm. uh, the need for infrastructure investment in California is probably in the trillion dollar range over the next couple of decades, and there is no way we're ever going to finance that with the traditional general obligation sort of uh, debt approach. And so we're going to have to figure out other ways, public-private partnerships to bring cap private capital in and some things that are hard to do but ne necessary. And we're going to have to start saying, hey, we can't finance all these good ideas. So in the context of when you want to talk about water, education, freeways and other transit systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you have to, I think, have sort of question mark on high-speed rail. I voted for it. I think it's a great dream. I'd love to see this, if it could be successful, I'd like to see it happen. I'm real increasingly skeptical about the business plan, about the railroad to, to train to nowhere, and you know other things uh, that are going on with the authority. Uh, the governor is committed to trying mm -hmm. to make it work. I think that's probably the right attitude right now. Uh, but they, these are decisions that are very imminent. Oh, and there, of course, there's the uncertainty of federal funding and so on that's mm -hmm. also been counted on. And rather substantial escalations in cost of project mm -hmm. and whether you can really, as is promised voters, run it on the fare box. Um, virtually no transit system is in this country although some of the high-speed rail systems in uh, Europe pay for themselves. Mm. Um, so uh, I think there are real good questions that are being asked and, and they need to get answered before we invest billions more. Uh, there was another audience question about what do you think is the future of redevelopment agencies? Who, who asked that? Wanna well, um, there you go, Mike. Yeah, yeah, I mean, right now the immediate question is what's going to happen in the, in, in the state Supreme Court with respect to these laws. I supported the governor's proposal, mm -hmm. and it's really more about priorities. Uh, there's enormous waste. The redevelopment agencies are debt machines. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to have debt machines that are never voted on by the public, unlike state bonds or whatever, well, okay, I mean, it's okay to do it that way. But it, they're mostly developer sub subsidies, and here's an interesting number. If you look at all the commercial development in the last decade in California and ask how much of it happened by operation of the marketplace versus how much because there was a developer subsidy in this mechanism, well, the answer is 94% was done by the market. Mm. There's some magic to it. And you have to wonder of the 6% how much was worth doing mm -hmm. and whether any of it might have happened anyhow without these politically uh, sensitive uh, and uh, political decisions that get made. I get it, the local agencies who whine a lot about they're stealing our money again. The essence of redevelopment funding is you're stealing everyone else's money and putting it in your pot. Hey, you know, I mean, talk about hypocrisy, my yeah. God. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I understand why they like it. You know, they see those projects. The professionals love, frankly, the public employee professionals love the idea to invest other people's money and acquire some skills and have some fun doing that that they haven't done in the private sector. So they get to play, you know, Monopoly. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, and for the elected officials, it, they take care of their friends. And there's just too much questionable practices around. Now, that's not to say there aren't good projects. There are a lot of good projects. But that's, and n all of that is irrelevant compared to the fundamental question is, if you've got a couple of billion dollars, should it go there or should it go into public schools? How do you prioritize? You don't get to do both. So you got to do one or the other, which is a higher priority. For me, investing in education is a higher priority than those schemes. So uh, it's pretty easy for me to sort that one out. Time for one more question because I know uh, the treasurer needs to take off. And I have one more question for you too, John. Uh, can you address corrections and the impact of our sentencing policies and incarceration on our budget well, we, yeah, we, uh, it's been the big growth area. By the way, I, I, a related thing I want to mention, because on the ballot has qualified mm -hmm. uh, a cap on state spending, ACA4, that was passed, and it's waiting for the next opportunity to go to the ballot. It probably passed. It's a bad idea. Uh, first of all, it guarantees long-term shrinkage of the public sector. Mm -hmm. 
if you want to have the public sector be the same as its current size, you have your growth rate be the same as the growth of income, personal income in the state. So that keeps things sort of constant. That's about 5% in California. Uh, the ACA4 provides for 3.8% growth. So over time, you have a shrinking of public sector. Additionally, if you're obligated to not spend more than 3.8%, and either your correctional budgets have historically been 10 to 15% growth rates, which theoretically is going to now change with realignment, we'll see, and for sure, your health care expenditures are routinely substantially greater than that then the only way you average down to get to the cap is you cut education spending, and especially you cut, you cut higher education spending, which is almost the only thing you can cut in California without a successful lawsuit challenging you doing it. Terrible policy, just an awful policy. It's going to pass because people are for spending caps, but I'm one that's saying bad idea, uh, and we, they ought to take it off the ballot or rethink it or change it or get the right numbers in or something that would be – now, I don't think the Republicans can. They're incapable of uh, exercising any smart flexibility with respect to these uh, issues. But correctional policy, I tried for years and years to uh, deinstitutionalize a lot of low-level offenders, um, have community reentry, drug treatment, and other programs that in other states, including conservative states like Texas and elsewhere, have been successful. And the politics are so awful uh, that you can't get people to make changes. Oh, you had a question. I did. What is yeah. it? Um, I had a comment, too. The comment was I've learned a lot from, from um, this conversation today, and I appreciate it. Um, as usual, you're very frank and, um, and very informative. So um, you've been, you were 25 years in the legislature. You were eight years as attorney general. You're, you're, you're in your second term as a uh, uh, treasurer, you must have a lot of observations about what life in public services I is like. And I, I'd, I'd just like, I think it'd be useful for all of us to try to get an understanding of, you know, what it means to have that, that, that amount of time in public service. And um, is there anything you feel like you haven't accomplished yet? Oh, know, there's a long like list to? of haven't accomplished. Yeah, well, I'd, yeah. I'd like to hear about well, those, you know, those well, are both things. In public service, we want to change the world. Yeah. You know, now maybe it's because you have an alcoholic daddy and you're a codependent type that wants to serve people. Uh, I mean, I, maybe, I know I'm going through this discussion yeah. with myself these days, but uh -huh. so maybe that's where, you know, you get uh -huh. that impulse. But here's what it is. I, the thing I want to say more than anything, I think, is this. Th there has never ever in human history been a large place that tried to experiment with the idea that everybody counts, that every voice matters. What an amazing idea. It's a glorious, wonderful, noble idea. And for those of us that labor there, that's kind of what we're doing. Mm. We're, I think, trying to make that more real. And there's been substantial progress in the whether it's a civil war that got fought or enfranchising women or expanding the electorate in various ways. Uh, unfortunately, the influence in money in politics is such a powerful counterforce that I don't know where it's going to wind up, but, uh, but it's just a wonderful idea. And uh, I, that's, that's the fire inside that's for me here. still that's trying to see how do you make that idea more real. And what's on your For a lot list? of people, it isn't. What's on your to-do list? Oh, you know, I, I, I tend to, I'm kind of Aristotelian in the sense that I take the immediate challenge, the practical problem, you know, how do I convert billions of dollars of pieces of, you know, about eight billion dollars a day go through my shop. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is pieces of paper. Let's make it electronic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it, a lot of it is just very Mm -hmm. specific and practical. It's not global. Yeah, I'd love to help fix the healthcare system mm -hmm. or something or the education system that probably is beyond our collective capacity right now. Uh, but um, so you keep trying to make incremental improvements. It sounds like making government work better is... is well, I think that's the big challenge and it's especially true. Uh, Republicans don't believe in government and don't want to make it work better by and large. Uh, the Democrats have got to get to that. And, uh, and it's not just spend more, tax more of mistake. Mm -hmm. 
They've got to figure out, and I'll just give you an example that I love to give. But so I get elected attorney general, and I, you know, I thought it was a law firm, and I found out it's mostly electronics and uh, crime labs and cops and stuff like that, but, and a law firm. Uh, and I, they got a DNA lab. And so they've collected a couple hundred thousand DNA samples, and they're in the refrigerator. No one ever digitized them. As a consequence, when they get some DNA from a crime scene, and these are mostly crimes against women and children, they can't compare to a file to catch the guy. Well, they caught one a year. Okay, Crash program. Not a lot of money, frankly. Just devoted scientists, new gadgets to do parallel processing in DNA and other things that we invented and we should have licensed, frankly, and didn't. But um, When I left, I think it was instead of one a year, 20 a day. Now, that's a practical thing to do that makes a difference. Let's do that everywhere. And with respect to legislators, more than anything else, what I wish they would do is get a Republican and a Democrat together and go look at something. Mm -hmm. Don't just expound in Sacramento or wherever about you know, your infinite wisdom and philosophy. I'm sure it's uh, wonderful. But just go look at something together and talk to the people that work there. What is this program you're running in the health department or wherever it is? And don't just talk to the director of the operation because they're going to tell you they need more PWAs. Talk to the people that work there. Mm -hmm. What do you see that would make it better, that would make it more efficient? And try to do it collaboratively and do it in a grounded, practical way that's not philosophical. More than anything, I wish that's what they would do in Sacramento, and particularly because of term limits and they turn over so rapidly and so on, that it would be a constructive thing. You know, wonderfully uh, to come out and uh, talk and think about and, these things. And, and you're wonderful to be here, and we appreciate Thanks. your life in public service and what you're doing right now. I pleasure. love the work. It's fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much.